Good evening, brothers and sisters. I ask you, do you know? Do you know? Who? Prince, the money in this country. Yes. I bet you think you know. Well, I've got news for you. I thought I'd seen it all. I never thought this liberal government could do anything worse than the Benghazi fiasco. And then came Harambe. Tonight's video lesson It's going to be a little bit hard for you to handle, but I'm going to tell you the true story, the truth, and the true story behind the cover-up of the Harambe massacre perpetrated by this liberal government. Something far worse than you could ever imagine. I hope you'll stay with me and hear the awful truth. The title of tonight's story is quite simply Labels out. Labels out for Harambe. An Illuminati cover up of the most diabolical intentions, and I'm going to blow the lid clean off. I stopped by a store I like to call Malt Liquor Heaven. And in Malt Liquor Heaven, I got a glass, a glass bottle of cold 45 malt liquor. Keep it in the glass, people. It's America. And the least we can do is keep our glass clean. How could they ever think to put malt liquor in a plastic bottle? But I wanted to do something special in memory of Harambe as I tell you the story. So I got a Colt 45 double malt. A double malt in a 24 ounce can. These are hard to get where I come from. The most superior of beverages. Oh, the perfume. Labels out, my people. Labels out for Harambe. Oh, that's superior. Oh, I hope I don't burp. Ruin the whole thing. Now, this is a drinking game. It could be the first ASMR drinking game. Several people use my videos for 
drinking games. Every time I say pus gobules, they drink a drink. That would be my facelift for a demon or something. And every time I say <clears throat> jazz hats, don't count that one, don't count. But every time I say jazz hands, don't count, don't count. You have to take a drink in my Illuminati videos. Today, are jazz hands. I'll be dedicated to the memory of that great gorilla who gave his life to try to bring peace to the world before our liberal government and the Illuminati crushed his hopes and desires. Tonight I, I bring you the true story of Harambe. So from this moment on, this moment on, every time you hear the words, you take a drink. And I should do it 14 times, but I might not count correctly. But every time you hear, take a sip of whatever beverage you prefer. It could be a soda. It could be a beer. It could be alcohol, whiskey, whiskey, gin. Regardless, every time you hear that, you take a drink with your old friend and we get through it together. I have to do that. I have to perspire or my heart will explode. Drink all this more liquor. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you need to get something to eat, I also brought some food to have later. Okay. So some food in my cooler. I actually have a cooler to keep my beer ready at the ready and stand by. I don't know how long it's going to take or how many we're going to need. So whatever happens, we'll do it together. So from this moment on, we are together. And I will tell you the true story of a patriot who gave his life for someone. The cover-up of Harambe need not have happened. He could have lived on, but an accident occurred that took him prematurely from this world. And you read about it in the news, depending on your news source. You heard that a young lad fell when his mother wasn't looking into a gorilla environment at the Cincinnati Zoo. And inside this environment, they couldn't easily remove the boy, and a great gorilla named Harambe grabbed the young boy and drug him through the enclosure and there was a risk of him drowning the boy or hurting him so they eventually killed Harambe assassinated him if you will assassinated him and the young lad was then rescued I just drink. I don't have to drink every time I say jazz hands. I can just go at it. Here's one for you. Now, what really happened was a long time ago, Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote a book called Tarzan of the Apes. A human who could speak to the apes. The great apes had a language all their own. Could speak, could communicate. Well, this was 
produced as a work of fiction in the early 20th century. I am here to dispel that rumor right now and tell you that the great apes can indeed speak their own language much as they did in the books Tarzan of the Apes. Because um, they were forced over several years through colonization by Great Britain and the United States and other European powers to suppress their ability, World War I was fought to stop the great apes from exposing the fact that they could speak the English language, or at least understand it. And to this end, the populations of the great apes was eradicated um, in many parts of uh, Africa, deepest, darkest Africa. And this was done to, of course, silence them. And the good people of Germany and Austria-Hungary tried desperately to fight the battle for the great ape survival and lost. They lost through the Treaty of Versailles. They lost all their colonies and they lost the right to allow the great apes the freedom that they, they wanted. Many wars have been fought over issues of slavery and indentured servitude and freedom in this world. World War I was no less that war. If you remember, the uh, Spanish-American War was fought so that the United States could subjugate the Latino community, and they succeeded, and have subjugated them ever since. Um, World War I was, of course, fought over the great apes and their ability to become equal to human beings and have a right to their own destiny. While that was taken away, they were forced to, by gunpoint, by the point of a bayonet, to silence their voice, and from that day on, pretend to be irrational, dumb, poop-throwing creatures. Now, to prove this is a correct theory, I will say, have you ever seen the great apes' hands? They have the most wonderful jazz hands. <laughs> That's pretty good. And the great apes <clears throat> must always talk with their hands. They can do sign language. See, that's a way around the communication problem with humans. Oh, baby. Mm. Now, what happens is these human beings go into a cage with a great ape and start signing language. You know, like they say, the big asshole. You know, big asshole. And, uh, you know, father and mother and all that horse crap. But anyway, they think, oh, I just taught this ape how to sign language. Well, the ape's actually saying, like, I hate you. I, I hate you. That's what the ape is actually saying. In reality, I want to kill you if they weren't out there with the tranquilizer guns. I would rip your head off. That's what the ape is actually saying. I read ape sign language. It doesn't translate very well. You're sitting there saying, kitty, 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 and the ape's going, yeah, I rip your head off like a kitten, you know? I could just kill you right here. So that's actually what's going on. So all this time, World War II, of course, was fought for other reasons, uh, you know, to get even with what happened in World War I. And, of course, Germany lost again. So here we are. The world powers, the uh, hidden governments of the do not take kindly to the United States, Great Britain, and France, and other countries, a, a godless Soviet Union, stopping their plans. They want the great apes free. They want them to have the equal rights of a human being as a sentient being. Now, World War I fought over the apes. World War II, they sided with extraterrestrials and the dolphin population joined the cause and the great whales of the ocean, and the whalers nearly wiped out the great whales to stop them from winning the war. You may hear a lot of things about technologies like sonar, radar, inhibiting dolphins and whales from communicating in the oceans. Do you think that was just so they could see airplanes and ships? No. Do you think the Germans had a better submarine program 
and we're so far advanced in science for any other reason than they got that technology from the great whales from the dolphin community mm. and of course you know about the nazi brigades of great apes many stories have been written about great apes who were trained by Nazi scientists to use human weapons to fight in Africa. Yes, under Rommel. I bet you didn't know that. So the dolphins were trained to put mines around American ships. The great whales, of course, took on the submarine fleet of the Allies. They weren't quite prepared, but they did well for the first few years of the war. And the great apes tried to help Rommel win the war in South Africa. Of course, all of these expeditions failed. They were totally outnumbered by the Allies. Uh, I think the Axis powers had three or four nations on their side. We had like a hundred nations on the Allied side. Of course, we won. And we suppressed the great apes and the other intelligent animals of the world again. And this caused much celebration in London and New York and in Moscow. People danced and shook their jazz hands. See how I did that? That's pretty good. Okay. So, uh, that brings us up to the modern age. Of course, Vietnam was fought because it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a guerrilla war. Now, you've heard that term thrown around loosely. I know you all remember Walter Cronkite on CBS News going, and here's the world today. There was a guerrilla war in Vietnam. Well, it wasn't actually guerrillas. It was the great, uh, what are they called? The orangutans of Vietnam and the uh, Gigantopithecus of Southern China fighting against the United States on the side of communism for freedom, their last ditch effort of the great apes to gain their freedom from the colonization of the great powers of the 20th century. And of course, you know how that ended. We lost that war. And the orangutans, of course, ascended to uh, freedom in their own right. Uh, many of you have seen any which way but loose or any which way you can with Clyde the orangutan uh, drinking liquor, shaking his jazz hands. Gotcha. And basically being a diabolical actor, made a lot of money in America and went back to Vietnam where he came from. Most people don't know the Sumatra, Sumatran uh, orangutan, of course, has uh, been a, a, a feudal empire of its own. Then actually enslaved human beings for the last uh, 10,000 years. Who would have known the orangutans of Borneo, Sumatra, and Vietnam would deforest their own forests for greed and money? Human beings would never do something like that, deforest a primeval jungle for wood, for farmland, but of course those orangutans would. Their greed knows no bounds. They have the avarice of the worst of humanity. And I am just ashamed of the orangutans. That soon there will not be any of these jungles left. And of course we won't even get into what they've done to the rhinos and the elephant populations there. We'll just leave that out. So how does the Illuminati figure into this? They didn't know that the orangutans would do that. But there was a, a the peaceful great apes of Africa we're hoping for a more diplomatic solution than a, a new future World War III or a, another guerrilla war like Afghanistan with the Gigantopithecus land grabbing in a very poor, destitute human country, threw the Russians right out, turned back Russian and Chinese communism in Vietnam and in Afghanistan with the help of the French. So nobody knows who's on whose side. It's just a mess. And um, you just can't trust the orangutans. You just can't. You just can't trust them. Don't trust them, okay? Now, let's stay focused. The great apes, of course, were more diplomatic and peaceful. 
they follow the teachings of Gandhi, of course, um, uh, political, uh, political resolve could solve a problem where a war would fail. The great apes were, um, masters of, um, what do they call that, uh, passive aggressive behavior. And, um, oh, I forget the other term, you know, jazz hands. Give myself a minute to think here. Um, I don't know, where they just, uh, sit-ins, political sit-ins. Where do you think those kids learned that in the 60s? They learned that from the great apes. And, uh, of course, if somebody really pisses you off, you just fling poop at them. The chimpanzees, of course, mastered that. I mean, who hasn't been to a, a great ape enclosure and yelled, Boomangane, Boomangane, one too many times and ended up eating fecal matter for their lunch? Hmm. That's, that's a ch old chimp trick from back in the day. So that brings us to the great ape leader Harambe. I think that was five. Jazz hands, five. Five jazz hands. So that's six right there. And we're getting there, baby. Okay, so then it brings us to the great ape leader uh, Harambe, who published many books many, many books in the 20th century, uh, wrote many great novels, uh, many of them turned into movies. He was just a wonderful man, a very wealthy great ape at the time of his death, but still living a life of servitude with his human handlers. But hoping through his political ways he could convince the next generation to look at the great apes more gently, more openly, more with a kind eye, not an angry eye. And his moment came this year. Now, oh, forgive me, this is going to be... It's going to be hard for me to talk about. This isn't a joke. I know everybody thinks it's a joke, but it's not. Harambe... was of course the dominant male ape in that enclosure in the Cincinnati Zoo. And they still follow their instinctual pecking order of the familial order. As the dominant male, when that little child fell in the water, he fell in the water. The water broke his fall, but he immediately lost consciousness, began drowning. Everybody screamed, well, that's what human beings do, they go into a complete utter panic. Harambe, being the man that he was, the learned, educated man, the highly educated great ape that he was, Harvard graduate, rushed forward and scooped the little boy out of the water, turned his head backwards so that his mouth opened naturally, his tongue fell forward, He'd taught many CPR classes to the primate mothers at the Cincinnati Zoo to prevent a catastrophic uh, disaster if one of their babies fell into the water inside the enclosures. And he turned the boy over and then performed mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, which is not easy for a great ape. They don't have the same li the, the lips. The lips give them away. But he did it. It's very hard with a, a youth because you, you know, their lungs are so small. The great ape is so big, you have to be very gentle. P p you know, little, p p p little tiny p p p p breaths because you, you'll blow his lungs up. You'll fill his stomach full of air and he'll throw up in your face. So just, p p you know, CPR. Harambe gave the boy CPR. A few breaths, turned him over, you know, put his head below his waist. He was so strong, he just... And the boy... Expelled the water from his mouth. Expelled the water from his mouth. Coughed. And came to life. Came to life right in Harambe's arms. I need you to know that. He gained consciousness. Life was restored. While he was in. 
around his arms. And what did the human bystanders do this whole time? They yelled for help. And of course it came. The handlers arrived. Oh, that's good. Okay, that one's gone. <laughs> Hold on, kids. This ride's about to get bumpy. Oh, now look what we got here. We got to do this one. Is one. So, okay. Jazz hands for Harambe. All right. Hang on now. Oh my God, this stuff's cheap. Buck nineteen for this one. Buck nineteen. <sighs> Never thought I'd see that. A dollar nineteen for some old English shoe polish. Oh, old English eight hundred. Labels out for Rumpy. Oh, that's some good malt liquor. That double malt hit you. Okay, so I got this towel, tea towel. Because I like getting the water in my mouth. Wipe it all off. Okay, so. <clears throat> Set me up with another one, soldier. me want to celebrate jazz hands Whew. yeah baby that was a good one I think we're up to eight so anyway the handlers came the handlers came then there was Harambe holding a crying human baby boy in his hands his mother screaming please let my baby go please and Rambi, with those great, old, ancient eyes, held that baby up, looked at the mother, and did the only thing that he knew to do. He stretched his great ape arms out, stretched his short ape legs as far as they could go, standing on his ape hand, tippy toes, he handed the baby back to its mother, and in that moment, her eyes met his gaze. Truth, justice, reality set in as the woman realized, oh my God, he's a sentient being like me. He smiled at her. He let the boy go and lowered his arms, sat down, and immediately took a bullet to the head dead before he hit the ground. He never knew what hit him, but he knew they would kill him for that. As he fell to the ground, as he fell to the ground, Harambe looked and said, of course, of course, of course. Everybody in the enclosure looked around and said, oh my God, he, he spoke. He said, he said a word. He said, of course. Oh my God. And they quickly removed the woman and child. Liquidated all other standbys. They put her in a room and said, hey, you have two choices. Death or take this check and sign this paper of non-disclosure. We want copy.
copies of your DNA and blood. And we're going to insert a tracking device into you to make sure you never tell what happened here today. You can speak to the press, but you'll give them this story. This story. This made-up jazz hand story of what really happened to Arambe. You'll, you'll, you'll never, you'll rue the day. You'll rue the day. They shook a finger at her. Harambe's dead laying there in that enclosure. All those people are dead in that enclosure. We've got our 9-11 reenactors lined up ready to tell the press the same story you're going to tell them, that that ape drug that boy through the water, that he was going to kill that boy, and we made the decision to assassinate him kill him before he killed the boy. A human life's more important than a ape life. An animal's life, an animal's life is never equal to a human sentient being's life. Ah, and there lies the lie, the biggest lie. The great ape is not equal to the man because he's not sentient. Mm, he has no soul. There was a lot of applause at D.C. They had a special congressional meeting that night. The handlers who killed, nay, assassinated Harambe. Jazz hands. We're brought directly to oh, Washington, D.C., to the Capitol building from Ohio. And they were each given a Congressional Medal of Honor and a Purple Heart for risking their lives because one of them got injured. He broke a nail on the gun firing mechanism when he pulled the trigger. He snapped his fingernail, cocking the gun. So they were all awarded Purple Hearts and Congressional Medal of Honor and, and uh, the French Foreign Legion Award because one of them was French and the other was a Jerry Lewis fan. Stay with me, people. We're almost there. So then the Illuminati got word of this, that the great ape Harambe was destroyed, assassinated. I think I'm twisting the story, but the Illuminati was on Harambe's side and the United States had broken the treaty, broken the Treaty of the Great Apes. First signed and written by Edgar Rice Burroughs himself and Tarzan in 1918 in Versailles. All those years, all that money the Burroughs family made off of the blood of the Tarzan family. Mm. And the great apes that lay dead dying in a field. Every Tarzan movie you've ever seen. Jane... The natives running around going, Booga boo, laka 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 boo, Tarzan. Pretend in your mind. Go back. Johnny Weissmuller swinging from a branch. Uh, and Jane. And Boy. And Cheetah. And the natives running around, you know. Take all of that away. That's all Hollywood. And replace every other character with an ape. I'm telling you the truth. Tarzan did have a Jane. But she wasn't a redhead from Ireland. She was a great ape. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. hey, they buried him with his picture. With her picture. Well, his picture too. Boy was a gorilla too. I mean, I think he was Tarzan's kid. We don't know. Nobody knows. We, he looked. He was. He looked like a Sasquatch, to tell you the truth. He was. You know, I don't know. The Bigfoot ASMR is another story. That video's coming soon. But Jane, she was a gorilla. She was a big gorilla. She. 
and he liked her. He liked it that way. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. I mean, he was raised by gorillas. What'd you expect? They hint at it in the books, but in Victorian delicacies, they never quite told the true story of Tarzan, but Tarzan was a player, player, and there weren't no natives hanging around, if you know what I'm saying. And uh, so whenever Tarzan went to the village, that was actually the Intelligent Apes village, where they were all learning how to use guns, the Germans were teaching them, and how to throw grenades, the Germans were teaching them, and how to fire a whore, how it's her uh, artillery piece by the Germans, and drive a tank, all that horse shit. And then Tarzan was, you know, making out with the girls, because he liked, he liked it. He just, you know, once you go ape, you never escape. You know what they say. <clears throat> I don't know if that's going to get me in trouble, but I still said it. I I put it out there. I mean, am I the only one that read those books? And Tarzan was like, you know, went through puberty with the great ape village. I mean, he won. Jane wasn't even there, so... <laughs> <laughs> hey, to each his own, you know, I don't, I'm not judgmental, you know, jazz hands, <laughs> jazz hands, it gets harder after a while, okay, so, okay, where are we at now, okay, so Tarzan was doing his thing, and Jane died, he out, well, Jane actually outlived Tarzan, Tarzan, you know, Everybody knows this, this true story of Tarzan. Even though he was a health nut, he had a bad heart. And, I mean, back in the 70s, too much bacon, just, boom, right over. And, you know, so Jane died after. And boy, you know, because boy was, he was a mess. Boy got that job on six million dollar man as big, you know, Sasquatch Bigfoot, and then Lee Majors ripped his arm off. He ripped his arm off, and uh, you know, and then he went to the spaceship, and they reattached his arm, and he was just all after, he just wasn't the same after that. And then the Bionic Woman, the Bionic Woman, uh, fought Bigfoot. And then they had to fight these uh, robots that didn't have no faces. These robots, they'd, they'd slap them, punch them real hard, or hit them with a log or something, you know. <laughs> you know, slow motion. Like, you know, Six Million Dollar Man. And, hang on a minute. You do the jazz hands to distract them, you know. And then you cry chop them, and their face would fall off. And they had these robotic faces and uh, Sasquatch couldn't handle it this whole thing you know like you know he felt like he was you know, lying to his people he's not a robot he's a freaking gorilla or something a goony goo goo and he was pretending he was Sasquatch jumping around he didn't even have the feet for it they had to put these big big slippers on him and he kept stepping out of them, and, and he'd stand there and cry. He, he just, he would look at Lee Majors, that's a six million dollar man, and he would just, you know, just cry. He would just stand there and bawl like a baby, and Lee Majors was like, what the hell's the matter with you, you pussy or something? Like, straighten up, you look like a shithead, you know? So they brought this Japanese soldier in there, and this, uh, they did, they had a, six million dollar man was after this Japanese soldier, Japanese soldier. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm, t I'm not making this up. Six million dollar man went to this island and there's this Japanese soldier running around, you know? He got the whole island booby trapped. He still thinks World War II's running around and uh, six million dollar man falls down in a hole and uh, cuts his leg. And then he's like, uh, oh, the Japanese soldier looks down and says, well, you're a robot. Well, then the war must be over because we didn't have robot technology in World War II. So Lee Major says, yeah, I'm trying to tell you it's 1975, you know, yay hole. 
and you just want to bayonet me because you think Hirohito's still in charge and he he's he quit he's he's in Vegas you know at the Taj Mahal with a bunch of hookers so he's like Taj Mahal Las Vegas can I go and he's like sure I don't give a shit and he's like woohoo jazz hands you know he wanted to see Frank Sinatra that was jazz hands right there was just one so that was the truth of that story. So they took the Japanese soldier there. Now this is where it gets weird. They brought the Japanese soldier back. Okay, Lee Majors rescues this Japanese soldier who was on an island by himself for like 30 freaking years. Uh, 35 years. 30 years. He's hiding in the jungle, you know, booby trapping shit. You know, he's running around with this gun, you know. You know, I'll get you a six million dollar man. And they brought him back. As a co-star, he was a fantastic co-star, and 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 they had to stop this kid in the jungle. There was this goony kid out in the jungle, like Tarzan Jr. And they originally story. This, I'm coming back to the. I'm going back to the Great Apes. Hang on a minute. Just I'm going back there. Um, so originally the story was boy Tarzan's son, the goony goo goo, uh, gr gorilla uh, hybrid thing, whatever he was was going to be playing a jungle boy, you know? So they shaved him down, and that was bad. He looked like a werewolf, and they shaved his ass, and he had this, I mean, he looked like a freaking human lion with this mane on his head. And so they shaved the uh, boy down, and he starts crying. He comes out, he's all naked with this little loincloth covering his junk. And he, I'll tell you, Tarzan was, was hung like a mule. A lot of you don't know that. John, I'm telling you, Johnny Weissmuller was the guy. They picked the right guy for that. He had a swimmer body. You know what I'm saying? Like he was, you can put him in the water and he looks like a freaking, like a fish. Well, boy didn't inherit that. Uh, he just, you know, he's like, everybody's like, well, boy, his apple fell far from the tree there, you know. He ain't got nothing going on down there. He's, you know, he's, I'm shy. The water's cold. A shrinkage. You know, you think Seinfeld made that stuff up? It's 1976. Bicentennial. Lee Majors and the Japanese soldier on the set. A uh, bionic woman's over there, you know, over there. And bionic dog. They had a bionic dog. And boy's standing there in a loincloth. He looks like freaking... Attila the lion standing there. What's his name? Saban? Saban? What's the name of that lion? In uh, Lion King? Anyway, he looks like George Earl Jones with a freaking lion mane on. And he's standing there like Darth Vader going, Luke, I'm your father. And it's just a horrible mess. It's just a horrible mess. He's bawling like a baby. You know, shaking like a leaf. You know, jazz hands all over the place. <laughs> jazz hands. God, this is so horrible. I'm embarrassed. So, bottoms up, baby. Lee Major's like, get in the hell out of here. And get that uh, other kid actor, that uh, Leaf Garrett or somebody. So they went and got Leaf Garrett, or somebody look looked like Leaf Garrett. They said, put some mud on him. And dirty up his hippie hair and just take his shoes off make him run through the field there and like he ain't even a big foot his feet are only like size nine the guy was six boy was like six foot nine seven foot tall he, he was he was seven foot four i don't know what he was and they tell everybody andre the giant was bigfoot in those six million dollar man movies and then so was that lurch guy but the truth was it was actually played by Johnny Weissmuller's son, uh, Boy, and the problem was he kept stepping out of them shoes, and like, they're like my God, you have like feet, your your feet are smaller than some women's. How the hell do you even walk on those pins? You look like you're gonna fall over on your on your head. On your the, 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 the. actors' equity wouldn't insure him. He couldn't get a role. His dad was dead. His mom was dying. You know, of a broken heart. She wanted to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge like, you know, Johnny Weissmuller did. They, 
you don't even know about that story. They shut down Manhattan Island. The hippies shut down Manhattan Island. They have a big, massive sit-in to keep Nixon from giving that speech in New York. I know. You never believe me. I actually know people that were there. I do. I actually know a guy that was there when they blockaded uh, Manhattan Island to keep uh, Nixon from giving that speech. Right in the middle of it, there's Jane up on a bridge, ironwork, going to jump off. <laughs> that was bad. That's not ASMR at all right there. This is, though. You know, they tap. When we tap, we ain't got nothing to work with. <laughs> when they tap, they're looking. Okay. Whoo, Jazzy. That's, <laughs> that's worthy. Okay, we're going to keep going for the diehards. Okay, so we're almost there. So hang in there. <sighs> okay, this is the last one. I'm going to save that 40. We're going to do some mukbak here. Mukbak. Can somebody explain to me this whole Mc, McBock thing? Oh, this is disgusting. I'm not drinking this. This is gross. Oh. <clears throat> Look at the dirt that was in the lid of that. Look at that. That's the top of this. Mm. I mean, it's called Crazy Stallion, but I didn't know it was covered in manure. This is a bunch of bullshit right there. 99 cents. Hang on a minute. I gotta clean this thing up. I'm not drinking that. Look at that. That's pretty dirty. It's gross. Hang on a minute. Hang on. This is good. Okay, so Jane's up on the bridge. She's going to do old Johnny Weissmuller off the Brooklyn Bridge. You probably don't even know nothing about it. But look, at 99 cents, look. See that? For all you happy people, this is going long, man. It's not easy to pound down. Where are we at? We're at uh, 48 right now. 48 ounces right now and 14, I think, jazz hands. Oh, jazz hands. <laughs> That's 15. Yeah, for all you true believers out there. Whoo, daddy gonna, gonna go down hard tonight. I could get something to eat. <clears throat> okay, so what we got now is this really crappy, cheap malt liquor called Crazy Stallion. And I got news for you. I know this from drinking beer for a few years. Just a couple of years I've been drinking beer. Don't mix your beers. And I just drank a cool 45 double malt right here. And I just finished a old English classic furniture polish malt liquor, 800. Labels out, baby, for Harambe. Okay, now hang on, babies. I got me a crazy stallion here. Okay, we're gonna crack that thing. Ah, oh, is there a hair on there? No. Okay, then we're gonna have a sandwich. 15, jazz hands, 16. Whoo, you guys having fun now? Hang in there, it's gonna get worse. So anyway, Johnny Weissmuller did this autobiographical movie where Tarzan's trying to escape from the uh, feds. They're trying to bring him in for a, a passport violation or something. He didn't have his green card, you know? Oh, baby. I know why that's 99 cents. At least that old English is a buck 19. But you know, the Colt's dollar twenty nine. So, you know. So, they got Johnny Weissmuller cornered on the Brooklyn Bridge. 
I've been there. And I rode, there's a, I'm going to tell you a true story. I've been to Brooklyn Bridge. And there is a, ro uh, a merry-go-round. There's a merry-go-round uh, enclosed with glass underneath the Brooklyn Bridge on the Staten Island side. I think that's Staten Island. I, I don't know. But anyway, you take the Brooklyn Bridge, you go there to Manhattan, but on the, that must be Brooklyn? No, I don't know. I've been there, okay? <clears throat> but underneath the non-Manhattan Island side is a, is a, uh, uh, I want to say roller coaster, but it's a horsies. It goes around a circle with chariots. Uh, there's a merry-go-round. Okay, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, and it's in a little park there. That uh, merry-go-round got to drink a little more to get level. That uh, merry-go-round was as has hand-carved wooden horses in it and it was built for a park called Idora Park. Idora Park was from Youngstown, Ohio. It was a park built a lot of amusement parks around the turn of the century in the early 1900s or tw yeah, tw yeah 1900s <clears throat> 20th century were built by employers to give their workers something to do. So on the weekends or when they had days off for holidays they could go to Idora Park and Kennywood Park and uh, Sandusky, they went to Cedar Point, and the families would go and have picnics, and the kids would ride rides, play games, and you know all this stuff. And that's when the around the between the 19th and 20th century, these parks started up. Idora Park was in Youngstown, Ohio, and they had this hand carved wooden horses. And when Idora Park's main attraction burned down, the Wildcat, they. Uh, sold all the other rides for auction. And this family from, I don't know if they were from New York or what, came in, and they bought that merry-go-round, lock, stock, and barrel. They bought every every piece, scrap of wood on it. And that guy spent like, I don't know, a million, three million dollars, uh, uh, remo not remodeling, refurbishing, or restoring that merry-go-round. And here it was the turn of the century, Hand carved merry go round. Every one of those horses was unique. Well, like a one of a kind sculpture that this guy made, you know, or this, this this business made. And they put it together and, you know, they put it, restored it completely. They put the cal Calliope music back in it. You know about Calliope music. Calliope music was those uh, player piano music that you hear at carnivals and stuff. People would have a Calliope machine or a, a piano, player piano, but a Calliope machine was a little different. It wasn't a piano. It was just a, a kind of like a music box, but it was a huge, like industrial size one, and it would play the, the music for the ride. And they restored the whole thing, <clears throat> and he donated it. I don't know if his wife died before or after. That was the idea. You know, once she died, I donated it. This guy was wealthy, and he donated that ride to that park in New York City, and they put that thing. Now, this guy spent, like I said, $3 million, oh, and the, he named the ride after his wife, and they put it in this glass enclosure in this little park on the other side of Manhattan Island on the Brooklyn Bridge, like underneath it, in this little park. And I thought, oh my God, that's the coolest thing in the whole world. I rode that when I was a little boy. I don't know if I told that part of the story. I used to go to Idora Park when I lived in Youngstown area. And I lived, I was born in Youngstown and I lived kind of outside of Youngstown. But I, I went to Idora Park like, I don't know how many times when I was a kid. We loved it. Oh my God, it was the coolest little park. It was tiny. It was a little tiny amusement park. It just couldn't compete after the 1980s with the big parks. 
So by accident or whatever, they burn it down. Who knows in Youngstown? Who knows why things burn down? Who cares? I'm not sweating anymore. That's kind of weird. I think I don't have anything left in me. So, uh, the long story short, I go to New York and there's that ride. And I was with my sons in New York and, oh, this is a true story. This is a sad story. I ditched my kids and their friends and I went there by myself. This is a true story. And you can ask them because they hate my guts because the whole New York trip went haywire. They got lost and separated from me uh, by, uh, we were at the Jerry Seinfeld's restaurant, uh, Tom's Diner. And that's uptown. And then we got separated and we were supposed to meet up in Coney Island at the hot dog shop, but they didn't show up till like eight o'clock at night. Pissed me off. But in the meantime, I went down to the Brooklyn Bridge and, uh, and I saw it. I didn't take a photograph or nothing. And I just wanted, I've never told any human being this in my entire life that I went there by myself because I wanted, I wanted something for myself. I've been a dad and a good husband and a lot of things for a lot of years and a good son to my parents. And uh, things weren't always perfect. They never are. But I wanted something for me. And I know it sounds stupid, but I just wanted to go there and look at that. I didn't want to ride it. I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to do anything. I just stood outside and watched. And I just wanted to look through the window of the glass and see it. So I could tell my daughter and my wife and anybody that cared that I went and saw something I rode 40 something years ago when I was a little guy. I was a little older than that, but not much. It was, it was really a cool moment. It was just nice to be doing something for me for just a m really small moment in time. And nobody knows I did that. I put all kinds of rumors out there that I did a whole bunch of things when I was in Manhattan Island by myself. And maybe I did or didn't do those things too. But I went down and saw that merry-go-round. And I'll tell another part of the story. Hang on a minute. Oh, jazz hands. Sorry if I took too long. Woo! Double jazz hands. Ah! <clears throat> I, we're about an hour in. This is crazy stuff. Um, I was sad because I thought I would do it for me. But when I got there, I wish that my kids were with me. I wish... Chrissy was with me or my little girl. Oh, if my little girl was there, I would have put her right on it. She was just little. It was a long time ago. She was just a little tiny girl. I would have put her right on it. It's funny, you do something for yourself. <laughs> well, at least I do. I do something for myself. And, and you know it's selfish or indulgent or silly. When you're alone. And then you realize this would be better if they were here. And I'm not making that up. I'm not saying this for your benefit to get you to feel sorry for me on the other side of the camera. To get you to slug more beer playing the Harambe labels out game jazz hands. There's one more. I'm not doing it for your benefit. Uh, you get to this park or this place or this moment in time and you look around and you go, this would be better if they were here. This would be better if my kids were here. This would be better if Chrissy was here. I, uh, it would be better if they were there. Maybe you understand that someday when you're in the same situation. Maybe it took an hour to get there, but that was the lesson. <laughs> or it was a lesson, not the lesson I wanted to teach, 
I wanted to talk about Harambe and great apes and be silly, which I think we did enough of that. But sometimes there's a lesson in there. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. A little drama with your comedy. Oh, I hate those comedy dramas. They're so horrible. Oh, I love Robin Williams, but he started these stupid movies where they were like, oh my God, it's so funny. And then the last half of the movie was just, oh my God, poor Rob Williams. He got shot at the end of The World According to Garp. It's like, oh God, why couldn't you shoot him in the first part? So I didn't have to go through all this horse shit in the second half. The label's out for Harambe. You know what I'm saying, brothers? Okay. Well, that's been a good hour. I hope all you people still like me. I gotta get something to eat in my gullet. Okay, I was trying to explain. Ah, shit. I dropped my buns on the floor. I got my mustard. Uh, I was trying to explain. Ah, God damn it. Where'd they go? They're underneath me. Well, that ain't gonna work. Hang on a minute. I don't know if I can stand up. Whoa. Ay, 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 ay. Where'd they go? Oh, there they are. Oh, good. They're still in the bag. Okay. Hold on, people. We're going to make it. Harambe, you didn't make it. Me and you were going to make it. Because we're humans. Did you get the whole Illum Yeah, whatever. Illuminati connection. Okay. I got paper towel here. This is disgusting. Place the pigs today. Alright, so anyway. I was trying to tell my son and daughter about these, uh... I don't know what they're called. Muck... Bachum videos or something. Where, and I hate them. Oh, they make me sick. I get sick. Here, look, I got some uh, Colby Jack cheese. Um, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about now. Uh, August 6th. August, sell by August 9th. This is like August. Uh, 16th. I think it's still good. I mean, it was refrigerated. I'm not joking. Look, I, it's August 16th. Look, what's that say? Sell by August 9th. Kids, this is why you shouldn't drink and drive. Right here. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Okay, so we got a bun, American white bun. Anyway, I don't like these milk box videos. They make me really want to gag. Okay, wait, look, I gotta show you this. Sal salami. I don't think salami goes bad. This is August 6th. Can you see it? Four ninety nine a pound. It smells like salami. It's been ten days or so. Salami. Put a couple pieces of salami on there. My son loves salami. And that's why this didn't get ate. That we bought this for that little prick. And he didn't eat it. So we got an American bun. Oh, I miss him. I miss mm, American bun. A lot of people don't know this guy. Mm. Let me tell you about a guy. He's dead now. He's my friend. Uh, mm, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Why am I doing this? It's so sad. Oh, I'm really getting upset. I had this friend. He's dead now. Well, I'll put some mustard on there. Here, this is a little bit of ASMR for you. Oh, slather that mustard on there. Oh, you know you like it that way. Oh, binaural mustard slammy. Slammy. Oh. Okay. Shh. shh. Oh. All right.
I had his friend, his name was Halsey's Kitchen. He's dead now. He died. Oh, his mother was heartbroken. I can't believe I'm talking about this. Okay, there's my sandwich. It's my sandwich. My mubak. Mukbak. Makapak. Mukbak. I can't stand those videos, but my daughter was giggling so hard. I'm going to do this for you guys. Mm. What are you funny? Look at that. Oh, that's, a, that's some girth right there. Okay. So my little girl wants to see her old man eat a sandwich online. Some will eat the sandwich, right? And my son's sitting there going, Dad, don't eat the food on the video. Because it's all about, you know, I'm like, that's gross. I ain't doing that shit. But I was like, oh, please, eat a sandwich. I'm like, so I do a search. And they got these people plowing down a plate of spaghetti noodles or rice peel off. I'm ready to throw up. Mmm. Son. Salami. Oh, baby. Colby Jack Cheese. I tell you more. Oh. Ah, Dr. Andrew Michaels. You make the best salami sandwich. Oh. Ah, whatever. <laughs> Labels out for Rombe. Okay, so where were we? So my daughter said, please finish the video. Eat a sandwich on camera. I'm a quiet eater. This is quite disgusting to me. But anyway, my little girl promised, made her daddy promise, I wouldn't take her to that uh, merry-go-round in Manhattan Island, but on the Brooklyn Bridge, but I, I'd need a salami sandwich for her. Labels out for her on me. Does anybody out there miss the office like I do? I miss the office. I, I, why couldn't Pam and Jim just leave and young Jim and uh, young Dwight take it for three or four more seasons after? Mm. I mean, Dwight was in charge. They didn't really give him a chance to develop. I think Dwight would have been a great boss. Andy was gone. Thank God for that. And um, I miss Meredith. Okay? I'll be honest. I miss Meredith. They could have done so much with it because, you know, Creed was gone. Uh, you know. Well, I don't know. But anyway, you know, Angela was there on the show. I miss Meredith. You know, she's my kind of woman. Um, there was that whole dynamic where Oscar I'll tell you what Meredith I'm a happily married man I'd give Meredith the world you know what I'm saying I don't think I could but I'd try to wear her out I'm not saying that's a good thing But I would try. You know, I think she deserves it. Jazz hands. Jazz hands. Mukbuck. Jazz hands. I'm probably not even saying it right. I don't care. 
my daughter had these noodles. Oh, romaine noodles. You know what the remains of noodles are? I had the conveyor belt. And what, what, what falls off and remains of the noodles, that's what they make the romaine noodles out of. Yeah, but you know, that's why I call them the remains. The remains of the noodles. Like, why don't you make me some of mukbang? Like, and people eat on the YouTube, and she says, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, mukbang video. Oh, I don't know. Well, look at the moose, the Macbuck, Macbuck noodles. And I we could bring it up, Macbuck. There's some guy plowing, some woman plowing a pizza, a cheesy pizza down. Eating a cheesy pizza, mook fuck ASMR. And I'm like, oh God, we ain't gonna make it. What the hell is this? Uh, my son's over there going, mm -hmm. I'm like, your sister's in the room. What the hell's the matter with him? I think he's retarded, but that's wrong. I know that's wrong, but there's something wrong there. I mean, I don't get along with my daughter, my oldest son. They look just like me when I was their age. But my other son don't look like me at all. I get along with him great, so. You know, uh, something bothering me there. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord, that deserves jazz hands. Where are we at? <sighs> okay, I'm gonna have to quit pretty soon because I ain't gonna make it. Okay, so anyway, I don't understand this who McBock thing. I'm not going to ever do it again. This is strictly for my daughter. And there was a time I went to this party. And this guy slipped me some acid or something. And I flipped out really bad. I think he gave me an amphetamine. And my wife uh, shook the car real hard, you know. So I get sick and made me throw up. So I got home and I threw up in a bucket and I felt better. And I said, uh, oh boy, that's really disgusting on camera. People probably lost a lot of respect for me right there. When I was a little boy, my mom told me I said, well, I had a little Hardy because Hardy died first and they never made a movie after. Well, I'm a little boy. Like, I'm like, I'm watching, this is like 1974, 73. They had the uh, Laurel and Hardy cartoon on TV. And, no, come on, this is serious now. Pay attention. People, you can learn something here. So I'm watching a little Hardy cartoon. She goes, well, the fat guy, he died. And then the skinny guy never made a movie again. Oh, my God. I said, what happened? Well, when the fat guy died, my, now my mom told me this. Like 1973. <sighs> this is why I don't eat on camera. I'm going to pass out here in a minute. <clears throat> I had a beer before I started because you want to prime that pump. You know, you want to prime it. So these three are hitting me hard, baby. I'm going to go watch some HBO after this is over with that Vice Principles. That's funny. I love Kenny Powers. So anyway... Okay, stay with me. Where am I at? Okay, so 73, 74. I'm a little guy. I go, Mom, how come uh, when Hardy died, he never made a movie again? Well, 
and nobody would give him a job when the fat guy died. So the skinny guy died. He starved to death. I'm like, holy hell. Well, that's bad. The fat guy died and the skinny guy starved to death? Good God. They were really into comedy duos back in the 1950s. Woo! So is that what happened to Abbott Costello? The tall, the fat guy died and then the skinny guy, he, he didn't make it. Oh, so the whole time I'm growing up, I'm thinking, well, Cheech and Chong, that Tommy Chong better not go anywhere or Cheech is done. <laughs> you know? I'm serious. This is the kind of stuff that went through your head before you had Wikipedia to look all this stuff up. I bet you didn't know how Laurel and Hardy died. So don't laugh. Don't make fun of me, everybody. Labels out for Harambe. And one last time. I don't even know how many it's been. Jazza! Oh, baby. That's disgusting. I'm glad you only got me one of these. Now, somewhere, somebody thinks this is good stuff. But, tell you the truth, this is... This ain't old English. Okay, so, what did we learn today? We learned that Dr. Andrew Michaels... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, could do... Three labels out. For... His boy Harambe. That's what we learned today. That not much else. Um, I still got a uh, double malt liquor 45 in here <clears throat> for backup. Well, hell with it. I'll keep it in the cooler. And uh, you just look at this one. This is Billy D would be proud of me. And I got a 40 of uh, Colt 45 in the cooler as well. We didn't get that far. Um, 24. Where's it at here? This has a big 24 in it. And so I like this one better. Okay. This looks like you're drinking like horse piss or something. Like when they said, all right, you're drinking horse piss. This is what they meant. But I just can't, I can't abide by that craft beer shit. You know, the craft beer, you know, you're sitting there sucking on a pumpkin beer. Mm, oh. Pumpkin beer. Just look at the lacing on that glass. Oh, the perfume. Oh, it does something for me. 11.9. But you can only drink one of them because they taste like shit. You're drinking it and it's full of freaking hops and wheat particles. You're chewing on the beer to drink it. Mm. Like, how many... You, you ain't drinking three of those bad boys, 24 ounce. You're only drinking 12 ounce of coin. And drink a 12 ounce of this pumpkin beer. This is the most elegant beer I've ever tasted. Just smell the bouquet. And it's like, what the? Get the fuck out of here. Drink some old English, man. Pound that thing down. 